I'm looking to be in it for about one five five, and mm-hmm. uh, the refi will come in, I believe, at at least uh, one six. So putting a little bit, maybe fifty k in the jeans. You know what gave you the confidence to move forward on this, Thomas, with like the severance? Have you done this before? Did you reach out to yeah. other people and get some insight? How did you decide that this could be done? Long story short, I fell flat on my face, um, but learned everything about it and knew what I needed. Um, luckily it didn't cost much, just a whole bunch of time. What is up YouTube? Matt McKeever here with another episode of Deal Destruction. Today we're going to be chatting with Thomas. Hey Thomas, how's it going? Good. How are you doing, Matt? Good. And so Thomas has got a property that he recently just uh, closed on in Guelph. It's going to actually be a bit of a severance play and a refinance play. So excited to jump into it. And he's actually got some before and after photos as well. So yeah, Thomas, before we maybe jump into this project specifically, do you mind just giving us some context towards your real estate experience so far? Yeah, absolutely. So I bought probably my first property was 2012. Uh, student rental standard. Uh, it was a six bedroom house. Uh, so it had tenants in place. Uh, they were getting 2,400. And uh, when they left, I, I bumped it up to 2,800. That was the first, uh, that was the first student rental I had. And that was downtown Guelph. Um, then since then I picked up a, a couple other properties uh, since then about four and uh, did a, a fair amount of duplexing, just uh, cutting them in half, putting basement apartments in uh, legally with the city. And um that's pretty much it. Student rentals is what I is I, what I try to focus on. This is going to be the biggest of uh, any of my projects. So, all right. And so, what's the long term goal with real estate investing? Just I'm assuming with student rentals, cash flow is a part of the puzzle piece. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, yeah, cash uh, cash flow, of course, is what I guess dictates any of my purchases. It needs to be able to cash flow on day one. Um, and like you and all your audience know, that's the most important thing. Um, and, uh, of course, building up at least enough uh, of monthly income so that I don't need to be working the nine to five as uh, all the fire people know. Awesome. All right. So this sounds kind of like an interesting deal. So how did you come across it? Was it on the market private? It was, it was MLS, uh, simple MLS deal. Um, it was listed for a while and it caught my eye, but it was too pricey. It was at 1.6. Um, uh, it's four semis, it's four semi okay. houses. So it's only 400 a pop, but I knew there was a lot of work that was going to go into it with the severance and, uh, ran into some more, uh, price tags, a parkland dedication and everything that, uh, than I anticipated at the beginning, but, um, got it down to 1.3 with the, uh, with, uh, my kickback from the, um, the agent, it came down to one, two, one, two, eight, three, seven, fifty. So, uh, 1.2, uh, one, what, sorry, 1.3 roughly. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, so average uh, average price about three twenty. Pick them up at and uh, going to renovate them. Currently renovating them. Uh, working on the severance right now. Um, the problem with it is it's in an R one B zone. Um, even though they're existing houses, uh, existing semis, um, I can I can show kind of uh, yeah. Let's do a screen share. Here. And so are these like you know, three beds upstairs, a bed in the basement sort of thing, or what are we Precisely. looking at? Okay, yep, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, probably best if I think. Okay, maybe I'd and then, good. so like uh, essentially a four bed, like one and a half bath or two baths? Yeah, there's, uh, as they're set up right now, uh, two, there, two of them are identical and two of them are also identical. Um, and uh, they're three up um no down on the older houses um they're it's a rubble foundation it's not going to be anything that can be redeemed down there but um the two larger houses uh the two larger uh, semis i'm going to be putting duplexing them and putting uh, the basement apartments in and, and one bedroom okay. so we can get down there mm-hmm. all right so it's it's these two here uh sorry okay. it's, uh, yeah. These two, these are the larger ones. And then, uh, these are the two older ones here. Um, so these ones are in rougher shape. There was some knob and tube that, uh, was in them. Um, 
these the separate entrance is, is through the back there um you can see that of course they were tenants mm -hmm. tenants there by all the junk and <laughs> yeah. um but uh, they were vacant when i got them which is great oh, excellent. um so they're just completely ripped apart right now there's not a functioning bathroom or kitchen in them they're completely gutted um and uh, yeah so th these are them here um just some pictures i guess i can share of some of the, the demo yeah let's work. check it out and then so long term when you're talking about sever severing them are we talking about severing into two lots or into four four okay, so so that really is a huge value add i'm assuming right yeah i think the up the arv so pick them up for one three um i've my pro forma is uh, say between uh, I, I'm very comfortable that it's going to be about 250 in that soft cost land transfer, absolutely everything 250 uh, in with the renos as well. Um, and uh, so in it for roughly say 155 and I think they'll be worth two at the end, very conservatively um, mm -hmm. six for uh, yeah. six a piece for these larger ones, legal duplexes, and then four a piece for the, uh, the small century ones each. Yeah. Gotcha. And so I'm sure there's some audience members here that are, you know, you've piqued their interest. Lots of people come across these unique properties, right? Where maybe there's multiple units, there's multiple buildings, some quirkiness going on. You know, what gave you the confidence to move forward on this, Thomas, with like the severance? Have you done this before? Did you reach out to yeah. other people and get some insight? How did you decide that this could be done? Great question. Uh, one, I had done it and I fell flat on my face doing it. Um, I, I had a, a lot that I sold, uh, uh, not a lot, the house, I tried to sever. Um, and uh, due to the heritage nature of it, the front footage, but long story short, I fell flat on my face, um, but learned everything about it and knew what I needed. Um, luckily, it didn't cost much, just a whole bunch of time. Um, <laughs> and uh, and it was just an existing property I already had with an 80 foot frontage and I had a garage on it that I didn't need and was going to cost me money. So I thought, Hey, I'm going to try to sever this off. Um, it was not successful because of the block face of the, uh, the average block face, uh, was too large for the, uh, the whole street had very large frontages mm. and they didn't say it would, uh, it would conform with the neighborhood. But, uh, also, but this one, uh, additionally, what gave me a lot more confidence is before I went firm, I spoke with the city at great lengths with those contacts, uh, that I'd made from, uh, the previous time. and yeah. Yeah. And, uh, they were a helpful resource, uh, which was, I guess not expected, but they were <laughs> actually able to, uh, put their neck out a fair amount and, and say that this was more or less a technical uh, severance in nature, just because it's a merged pin right now. Um, it's a merged parcel just because gotcha. one older gentleman picked them up and they kind of all just came together. Yeah. And just for anyone at home, that's maybe, you know, you've never heard this term merged pin before. If you end up owning two properties that are side by side that are technically on separate legal lots, if it's literally the exact same legal owner, those titles will eventually merge. And that really can impact the valuation of the property because part of the reason Thomas was able to pick up this property so cheap is the fact that it's a much bigger purchase price, 1.6 million or 1.3 million for this property versus being able to buy them piecemeal. In addition to that, just there's a little bit of complexity and same with like, there's a barrier to entry to actually getting them severed. So oftentimes, if we're willing to spend in the time and invest it the way Thomas did on that first property that didn't work out, we end up, you know, establishing or developing a unique niche skill set that can really end up uh, rewarding us handsomely. So that's awesome, Thomas. Really appreciate you sharing it. So yeah, let's jump into some of the photos of uh, the property. Yeah. So I, I just uh, this I think might be easier just to see some of them. So actually, another interesting thing, part of the negotiation, I'll just tell your group really quick mm -hmm. about is if you can see here on, on my screen, you can see that the, the frontage was advertised as 166, 88, uh, yeah. 166. So I did my research as well and knew it was 132. So I knew that they were misrepresenting it mm. here. And I, I, I wrote a letter actually to uh, the vendor and amongst other things uh, before the conversation was, Hey, I'm, I'm not going to try to beat you up and be a, a bad guy about this, but we're like, we're very different on what mm -hmm. we, we know what the size is here. And uh, we actually, I came to a standstill with the, um, uh, with the vendor and I just needed a price reduction. And, and what I did is I 
wrote him a letter just more or less pitching about how because uh, I, I write uh, the APS was in a numbered company and I was worried that he'd think I was some big guy yeah. and, like bullying him around and you know what I mean and um, so I wanted to make him the pitch say hey I'm a young guy but this is much as much as I can pay um, uh, I'm not I don't want to beat up your properties but there's going to be a fair amount of work here um, but yeah that's just one of one of the small things that helped me get a little bit of a leg up mm-hmm. um, appreciate you sharing that it's an area okay, yeah. Them. Yeah, that's a very useful angle just to get the feel for the lay of the land. Yeah, great lots. Uh, they're as f- and so did the seller already have in mind selling it vacant or was that something you negotiated? No, they were vacant. They were, uh, and of course, there was only 400K he had as a mortgage. So uh, it wasn't really costing them anything to sit there, but uh, but they were empty. So the, the condition of one of the units, which is of course all the, the listing photos will show, <laughs> sure. is, is pretty, this one's pretty good. This was yeah. the top right. Um, my apologies. And so was this gentleman just retiring? Was he just getting out of the game? Is that? Yeah, um, I think he was quite a bit older, uh, like maybe, uh, maybe just wanted to get rid of uh, everything. I think he was maybe moving into a nursing home. I, I don't have gotcha. a perfect line of sight, but I think because towards the end of the deal, he had someone else signing on his behalf. So, um, so gotcha. this, th- this picture here is in that uh, is on one of the houses on the right hand side here. And you can see the kitchen. What I've done is I've run a wall here and I, I can show it another picture that I've taken recently here. Um, I've run a wall and put a door and this is going to be where the separation is for, um, uh, for the secondary unit. Mm. I can show that in a moment, but th- this is the way it, the properties were. So three bedrooms up. Um, yep. I get some pictures of the older houses. So they, there are two bedrooms on the main floor, high ceilings, and then uh, a loft space. Gotcha. But no overhead light, classic older house, had to yeah. run all new wires. So um, that's kind of a, a pricey ticket. Mm-hmm. Although not- nice, the fact that at least unfinished, unusable basement means you can run your wires a lot more freer than if it was finished. Absolutely. Great access. Yep, exactly. And you can make a mess down there. But yeah. I, I unfortunately, <laughs> I, I did have to do some waterproofing. That's another attribute that definitely spooks some people off. There was, there was standing water in the basement when I picked them up. Mm. Um, so th- these are the kitchens really hard to work with. They're tiny little guys. Yeah. Um, but these are gutted back. Uh, this is where we are right now with the... So once I got it back, it was quite wet. This is the sure. size of this. So yeah, I just ripped it back as much as, uh, I could. And, um, this is actually the, the exact unit you're looking at. Uh, gotcha. Yep. Yeah. I can see exactly. I got a great price on, on kitchens um, <laughs> to any of your users. I haven't had them installed yet, but um, if, if so, the, it's, I could provide the link and, and down below, I was able to pick up this kitchen, uh, quartz countertops, uh, solid maple uh, for 4,000 flat before HST. Um, uh, got the four kitchens all together, the two larger houses, the two smaller houses for 18,000, 18,008. That's awesome. Pretty, yeah, pretty decent with the countertops and installed and everything. Mm-hmm. And then this is the this is the upper room. Um, so what yeah, I just kind of classic hip wall. Yep, exactly. So what I did here is com- got some great guys to demo it right to the studs, and um, uh, and I have got it back. Um, mm-hmm. And what I had is the those upper rafters. Shoot lost the picture, but the upper rafters, uh, raised up four inches. So just one by one took them out and, uh, got a little bit more ceiling height. Okay. Those four inches will make a real difference. Yeah. 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 So that's, I guess that's where, uh, that's where I am so far on it. I've had the tiles in they're putting in the bathrooms. I'm, I'm focusing on getting the, uh, the two larger semis up first. I'm targeting January 1st. Uh, to try to get them up and running, um, mm-hmm. and yeah, that's uh, that's generally it. I this is as far as my pro forma, uh, what mm-hmm. I went in on. Um, Love it, yeah, super detailed. 
Um, so what's the long-term plan with this? Are you going to just sever it and then hold it? Do you plan on selling some of them off, selling all of them off? Uh, hold them all. Um, yeah. I, I want to, uh, the financing of course is precarious on, on this. So it's uh, my plan at least is to do the zoning. Um, uh, the zoning, unfortunately, it's an annoying $14,000 in a very large time. A normal severance wouldn't take as long as this, but um, because it's in an R1B zone, detached houses, they're saying that no semis can be allowed, but of course they've uh, they've had them here and it, they're not willing to grandfather it, unfortunately. Uh, so first I have to get the zoning, then I get the severance, and then mm -hmm. I can do the work in the basements to put the two basement apartments. Um, and uh, so that's, I guess, once that's all done, then I can do the refi. Um, it's going to be, I think you'd call it a, a full burr or a, yep. a complete burr. Like a perfect burr, yeah, where you, yeah. you should be able to get all your money out. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, so, uh, looking at the, the refi to be, I'm looking to be in it for about one five five and, mm -hmm. uh, the refi will come in, I believe at at least uh, one six. So putting a little bit, maybe 50 K in the jeans, um, yep. uh, and a cash flows at that point. Um, I'm looking to get 2000, uh, this is super conservative, but 2000 per upper unit, for all four of them. So a total mm -hmm. of eight there, uh, 1200 for the basements. Um, they've got nice, uh, great lighting down there too. I, I think I'm being extremely conservative on all, all those numbers. So at least just a, a round 10, four, um, yeah. new mortgage, depending on the terms, I always just run with 3%, but, uh, 30 year versus a, a 25 year am, you can see that we're, we're looking at about 1500, uh, cash flow in the worst case scenario. Mm -hmm. Um, this, these are the only three that I'm entertaining. Yeah. These, I don't know what, uh, oh, these are with utilities. And, uh, but uh, yeah, these, these three entertain. I think it's going to fall probably between these two here, probably maybe 1800 positive cash um, on the back end and all the money out and hopefully move to the next. Awesome, man. Yeah. seems like a great deal. And definitely after going through this process, you're going to have a great uh, niche skill set that you'll be able to rent and repeat on any other future, uh, um, you know, semis that could be severed. Yeah. Um, it's hard though on, on MLS. I, I see all the great private deals, uh, mm -hmm. that you guys, uh, shoot out, which is, is great. But yeah, on MLS, it's hard to find something that there's enough meat on that you can do, spend a bunch of money and wait a bunch of time in order to make it work. Yeah, absolutely. I think in these hot markets, you know, the only real opportunities on the MLS are either wildly inaccurately advertised properties or unique properties and oftentimes they go hand in hand um so you know in this case it seems like the property was relatively advertised correctly right um they were off a bit with their lot size but that probably wasn't actually much of a deal breaker for most people but the unusual nature probably was just hard you know you're not going to get your average buyer looking to compete with you on a property like that so that's awesome yeah, yeah, no doubt. And all these are all going to be just gutting photos for the most part. Um, but you can see they're it's yeah, been, just old lath plaster in places and all that stuff. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Excellent, Thomas. Well, yeah, I definitely think that this is a great deal. And I love the fact that you found it on the MLS. I think that that serves as a great example for anyone that's, um, you know, struggling with this idea that there's no deals out there because the market's too hot. There definitely is always still an opportunity. It just really comes down to knowing our numbers being dialed into the process. So um, are you, it seems like you're taking decent amount of photos and documentation behind this property. So I guess that was one tip I was going to bring up um, depending upon how this conversation went was I think this is a wonderful deal to really document and use as kind of your portfolio piece, right? Where, if and when you start deciding to attract other money partners, um, you know, a deal like this is just going to line up in perfection. And in fact, for myself back in 2016, when I really started scaling my real estate portfolio, I essentially did a, uh, bought like a really rough around the ages 20 unit um, portfolio off of an old landlord and we converted it and essentially were able to do more than a perfect burr. So get more than, um, our initial capital out. And from that, I was then able to really just 
used that as a portfolio piece and leveraged so much credibility and so much more money having gone through and been like, oh yeah, I bought a 20 unit apartment building, you know, for X amount, we refinanced it. And then after refi, we walked away with six figures in cash. And, you know, it's very easy to get people's ears perked when they hear like, wait, you got a free property that cash flows plus, yep. you know, you walked away with extra money. So yeah, I love it, Thomas. I guess any, did you have any specific questions for me or anything that we should make sure we discuss on this call? Um, the, the question for you, I guess, I've never done a burr. So marinating time, do you think? Um, I don't think you're going to have any issues with a property like this because of the severances. So yeah. I think that um, any appraiser and any bank is going to treat it as a completely new property. So I don't think you're going to have any issues. And again, it sounds like it's a great situation to be in where um, if there's not a lot of semi-detached properties in that neighborhood, I'm going to guess that your average prices are going to be very robust, right? So even yeah. if you end up getting at the very bottom of the spectrum in pricing, you're probably still going to be very safe there from a valuation standpoint. So, you know, in more traditional burrs, um, it's not uncommon to get some resistance from bank employees or lenders if it's less than six months or a year. Again, usually there are ways to navigate that, but it is going to take a more deft hand. But in your exact situation, because of the land severance and the extent and scope of renovations you're doing, I, I wouldn't expect there to be any issues. So by the time you're actually able to have the properties done and rented out and um, appropriately severed, I think that you'll be good to go. And um, again, based on those price points, points, for what I know about Guelph, it seems like you're at They're a very cool. affordable point. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just, I guess that uh, is probably the biggest feedback I need to get better on that. I don't know. You're not, you're, you're not mentioning, but I, I think I maybe leave deals on the table because I want them to have so much meat on them like this. And mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. That's definitely something to take into consideration. Um, as long as you're able to get enough deals, then I don't really find fault at that. Now, if you're spending years or decades between deals, then yes, that's definitely a big issue and a red flag. But as long as you're doing the volume of transactions that you're setting out to do each year, I wouldn't worry. Like, yeah, there's great margin on this deal. I love it. It's the sort of deal that like back in 2016, when I was doing projects like this, I would have like ran that hard um, because there's so much upside there. Um, and again, if, you know, as long as you're hitting your quota for the volume of transactions and cash flow that you want to be building up in your portfolio, I wouldn't worry about being picky. I think that that's a great position to be in as long as you're able to find those deals. And if you do find the MLS starting to dry up, um, definitely hitting up every wholesaler you can find getting on their email list, quick little plug for my wholesale email list. If you guys go to mattmckeever.com slash private deals, you can sign up for our, our private email list. And we're soon going to be launching a We Buy Cottages business. So if you guys want to buy cottages in the Midland, Honey Harbor, Muskoka area, definitely hit us up and join that email list as well. Um, but yeah, this seems like amazing, Thomas. So are you on social media? Are you documenting what you're doing? And if so, can people follow along? And what are the best handles or accounts to follow? I'm not. I'm. Uh, I, I don't document it on on social media. Um, no man. No. Uh, although you can reach out to me on LinkedIn for sure, but it's not going to be anything really like this. It is more focused on my nine to five. Um, but uh, yeah, absolutely, Thomas McKillop. Uh, I'm sure we can put it in the handle here. But uh, yeah, I don't. I document it on myself on my phone. But uh, as far as advertising, broadcasting it, I I don't do a great job of that. Any reason behind that, or it just doesn't come natural probably doesn't come natural. Uh, and it's not the time, uh, because I, I, it's, it's not that, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't really have an explanation. I guess it just doesn't come natural. All right. Well, I would definitely nudge you to do so just because even, even if you don't need it today, at some point in the future, you likely will. And I know having done it now for four plus years, obviously you don't need to go to the extent or the breadth that we do on my social media, but there's so much value in just being there, right? Like being there for four years now, being there almost for four and a half years now on social media, you know, there's certain tipping points where credibility happens, right? Like the first year of being on social media, everyone's like, is this real? Is it legit? What's going on? But like, if you're just consistently putting out content and documenting your journey, 
a lot of interesting things can happen. It just gives people the opportunity to fall in love with you and your journey and then really want to buy in or invest in you and your future as well. So definitely uh, some food for thought there. And I'd encourage you because it seems like this is a really interesting project. I know a lot of people would be drawn towards projects like these. So I don't doubt that you'd be able to find an audience there that would be really interested in uh, following along in your journey. But as Thomas mentioned, we'll throw a link to his LinkedIn uh, down below. So if you guys want to hit him up, definitely encourage you to connect. Always great uh, hearing, you know, another Canadian investor that's out there crushing it while also juggling the nine to five. That's awesome, Thomas. Great. Thank right. you so much, Matt. <laughs>